um, trees, graphic, and uh, I mean, in terms of in terms of artistry. Uh, well, this is the last uh, seminar of the semester, and uh, we uh, some point we have to decide when to resume it. But right now, this is the this is the finale for 2020, and uh, I guess we're all in a very festive mood. And then uh, to uh, to complement that festive mood, we have a talk by Anne. Will talk tell us about well reverse plane partition a whole bunch of other things, and uh, with this I uh, turn the floor over to Anne. Thank you, Andre. Thanks a lot for uh, letting me speak here, and uh, to everybody for turning out in this time when it's supposed to be the holidays or something. Um, yeah, so reverse plane partitions and all of that other stuff, modules for the pre-projective algebra. So this talk is on uh, work in progress being written up, joint with uh, Balash Alec and uh, Joel Kamnitzer and Tani Lippin and Calder Morton Ferguson. And the goal of the, the paper, the main result of the paper that's being written up is um, showing that these reverse plane partitions, which are some combinatorial gadgets, which I will abbreviate a bunch as RPPs because they're a mouthful, um, are a model for minuscule crystals. So more precisely for minuscule heaps, we can define these RPPs and that's that is in crystal isomorphism with irreducible components of a variety of modules for the pre-projective algebra. So it's a lot of words, but the last the, the last half of this you might actually be familiar with under a different guise, the irreducible components for a variety of modules is also on um, Nakajima's core quiver variety. So the crystal structure on that guy is available, is known, and is due to Nakajima. Um, outside of minuscule uh, types. But, okay, the first half of that main result is what I'll spend the bulk or a big part of the talk talking to you about. So the plan for the talk um, is to kind of break down and motivate that result. Um, so, what it is, it's a new model for minuscule crystals. And new here is in uh, quotes because in type A, it's actually, it can be deduced, this model, this uh, RPP model, it can be deduced as a particular case of standard monomial theory or gelfin zetland patterns. Um, but outside of type A, like it's, it's generalized and um, well, it's not written down as far as we know. Um, and number two, sort of the motivation is the crystal isomorphism gives a geometric interpretation for the um, tensor product rule on uh, tensor product crystals, which everyone likes very much, but is arguably rather opaque or maybe unmotivated. Um, so I'll start maybe the more natural place to start would have been by talking to you about crystals, but I'm gonna start with uh, quivers and pre-projective algebra. So we have sort of two parts, the combinatorics and the geometry and the geometry is made up of these um, varieties of modules and the structure on those modules comes from pre-projective algebra. So that's what I'm gonna define first. So our input is a simply laced um, Lie algebra G and the simply laced assumption is needed in order to make sense of our, um, is needed in order to construct a pre-projective algebra. Um, the finite type assumption maybe can be dropped, but it's not something that we got around to yet. Um, and the input to the pre-projective algebra is the quiver of G. So for instance, if it's type, D4, then what is a quiver? Just as a reminder, um, it's an orientation of the Dinkin diagram of our group. So we just choose. Yeah. Um, 
And I, I think we all see the same slide as at the, so if you're referring to D4, I, you know, we can, we can picture it in our head, but I don't think we see it. Oh, where are you at? Are you on? Uh... Slide one, I am, I don't know. Is anybody else still sits? Oh. oh. What about now? Plan for the talk, that's what's on my screen. Okay, sorry, I think, uh, okay, what about now? <laughs> oh, D4, yes. <laughs> yeah, thank you, sorry about that. I'm also using my laptop and a monitor, so sometimes when I move the thing around, it, yeah, I shouldn't move it around. Um, okay, so this is D4, great, and this is, this is D4 with an orientation, this is a quiver. Uh, okay, the pre-projective algebra that we're going to associate to this oriented Dinkin diagram is the path algebra of the double quiver, where, you know, double means we're going to enhance this graph by throwing in oppositely oriented edges. And um, modulo out the pre-projective relation which is this guy. And you can sort of black box this, except that if, if, uh, if you want to know what this is from the point of view of the, 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 the quiver, which you probably already know, it's telling me to mod out by um, sort of the sum of the length two paths coming uh, in and out of any given vertex. Okay, the rest of this is notation. I don't think I'll need too much. Well, I here is going to denote our vertex set. So let's record it. And E is the edge set of the original uh, quiver. And E bar is those oppositely oriented errors. Um, okay, so why the pre projective algebra is kind of a bold slide, but I added in. Uh, anyways, that, that's an aside. So for quivers of finite type ADEV algebras, the uh, algebras pi that are formed as path algebra mod pre-projective relation are um, models for indecomposable representations containing each indecomposable projective exactly once as a representation of the underlying um, path algebra of the quiver. It's just an aside to motivate what many people think is kind of a unnatural construction. Um, nice features that this algebra has is that if Q is Dinkin, then this algebra is finite dimensional and also finite dimensional modules for it aren't going to be nil potent. And these are actually if and only ifs. And in particular, so it's also graded by lengths of paths. Pi is naturally graded by path length. So in particular, um, the zeroth graded piece is modules for the zeroth graded piece are just uh, I graded vectors, basically. And that's how you should maybe think of all of the representations of pi that you see here, first and foremost. And all you really need to know about it for our purposes is the following. What are simple modules and what are projectives that come from simple modules? So for every vertex, and I, we're going to denote by E sub I, um, the trivial path. And so I didn't draw it in our D4 example, but you can imagine just a loop going in and out, doing nothing. Um, and by capital S sub I, sort of whatever your choice of underlying field is, it's the one dimensional vector space spanned by that uh, path. 
And so this is going to be all simple modules are of this form. And it's the same as for uh, the path algebra of the core group. It also has just as many simples as there are vertices. And then the other thing is, like I said, so projectives coming from those simples, namely the projective covers, we're going to define as the unique and decomposable projective having a psi of the quotient, um, and such that any non-zero quotient intersects SI. So how we're going to picture this is kind of important for the eventual connection to RPPs, um, to our combinatorics. And let me do an example. In type A, let's take G equals SL5. So the quiver, um, let's orient it just like this. Um, by the way, in the doubled quiver, it doesn't really matter what orientation we started with. And for the pre-projective algebra, it doesn't really matter the initial orientation. Um, Okay, so this is my double quiver, and what is P3? So let me draw over this guy kind of a diamond shape. P3 for the pre projective algebra of Q is going to be a module which we visualize like this little rectangle of a chocolate bar, um, where the dots. Um, sometimes also denoted as digits to indicate what vertex over the Dinkin diagram they are living over. Remember, it's projective is in particular up I graded module. So um, the dots are going to are, are, are stand-ins for basis vectors. So this is our projective over vertex three. It's going to be one, two, three, four, five, six dimensional. And the arrows are telling us the action of kq of pi. Um, a priori of kq, it's like I have a theorem here, I'm going to map this dot to here. And maybe this basis vector, I haven't got any arrows coming out of it. So it's not telling me how to apply those elements of the path algebra. But that's just that just means that both of them will kill it. That's the convention. Um, okay, so there's a KQ action that's evident, or a KQ tilt action that's evident. Um, and actually, it descends to an action of the pre projective algebra. We simply require that, like, this composition agrees with this composition, and this composition agrees with this composition, and so on. Um, and in this picture, uh, my coloring is maybe a little confusing. In this picture, S3, the simple quotient, corresponds to that top dot. Um, OK, so among these projectives, which we have for type ADE, we're going to distinguish minuscule projectives and define this as follows. So first of all, we'll define uh, what it means for a vertex to be minuscule. And that's if the irreducible representation corresponding to the ith fundamental weight of our group is minuscule which just means that the vial group acts transitively on the weights. And PI will then be called minuscule if it's supported over a minuscule vertex. So for example, for type A, all the vertices are minuscule. The fundamental weights look like ones, a bunch of ones followed by a bunch of zeros. The minuscule representations look like these alternating um, uh, tensors of our 
standard rep and the eigenvectors are in fact permutations of, um, sorry, the weights of the eigenvectors are in fact permutations of this uh, corresponding fundamental. So that's just the sanity check. In type A, we don't really see like what, what's different if we choose, well, I mean, all the vertices are minuscule, so there's no pictures for, um, but kind of the point is that we don't have interesting pictures that we can match on the combinatorial side if we choose a vertex, which is not minuscule. Um, let's see. So we'll want to match up the structure that we drew in the A, for example, by some combinatorics. And there's yet another um, kind of type of object that we can color with the word minuscule, and that's um, elements of the vial group. So for another definition, W is called minuscule. If for some weight lambda and for some reduced expression um, of W, this is how it acts on lambda. So this is kind of nice, but also, well, so what? Um, more concretely, or and, and more visually, um, you can think of the minuscule elements of the vial group as the elements which are fully commutative, which means that their reduced words are related by commuting generators. And it's not true that this is an if and only if, but in some cases we care about actually, it is if we say dominant minuscule here, um, for the purposes of the talk, we should think of this just as fully commutative elements. And there's also some notion of minuscule for, um, isn't there some notion of minuscule for like a Schubert varieties or something like this in the flag variety? Is that, is that the same notion? Uh, yeah, yeah, I think it is. Okay. Yep. And in fact, there's some connection there, but uh, yeah, which I'll get to shortly. Um, yeah, it's absolutely the same notion. So for example, in uh, SN, the vial group of SLN, GLN, we have an element um, is fully commutative and only if it is three, two, one avoiding. So it doesn't inter traverse the order of three or more elements. Um, So how to, like, why is fully commutative easier visually? So now we're going to introduce some combinatorics to visualize basically minuscule elements in the form of minuscule heaps. So what is a heap? So this is So a heap maybe you've seen before is um, is going to be a a post set on well as as we'll define it, it we're going to associate heaps to uh, element of a vial group and a reduced expression for that element. Um, so the heap of a word, not sorry, I said reduced, but not necessarily reduced, uh, is going to be a post set on the on the index set, so on the, the length sort of of the, well, on the index set of the simple reflections occurring in the reduced expression um, with respect to this relation that is the transitive closure of the relation A stem B if um, the actual subscripts are, or, or sorry, yeah, the actual subgroups are ordered and the corresponding simple reflections commute or are just equal. Um, so stem here is for stem bridge and this notion is due to stem bridge. And from this condition, well, we can deduce that if 
W is a minuscule, then H actually does not depend on the choice of a reduced expression. So we can make sense of, so if this is a reduced expression, um, then we can simply denote this as H of W. Because remember, minuscule implies fully commutative, and that's just the well, it implies that reduced expressions are related by fully commutative elements, so nothing sort of changes as far as these relations are concerned. Um, okay, more concretely, so even more vis actually visually, I mean, we can try to draw those heaps. And I will in some examples, but first let me introduce yet another way of thinking about them. Um, there are these glass bead games that we can associate to words. And this is, well, I don't want to misattribute it. I want to say that it's due to uh, Herman Hesse, yeah, introduced by Herman Hesse. That, 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 right, there's that. a book. <laughs> It's a book by me. <laughs> um, but I'm not like, is it Clash of and Ram or is it uh, Wild Bird? I don't know. So I'm going to write uh, Clash of Ram. Or, oops. Uh, so the glass bead game of a word again, doesn't necessarily have to be a uh, reduced expression for any particular element, but it's just any input award, is played by dropping beads on uh, runners labeled by maybe like the set of integers that these subscripts take values in. Um, for us, it'll be the vertices of our Dinkin diagram. So on runners, which are anchored at those vertices, such that consecutive uh, beads dropped on kind of adjacent runners consecutively will rest on each other or will touch. And then the defining um, relation of the heap associated to W and an expression for W becomes A stem B if um, the ball dropped on runner IA is just below and touching the ball dropped on runner IB. Um, so we can draw some nice pictures with this new characterization. Right, but before we get to those pictures, I've added a slide here to say sort of more about motivation of heaps and those glass bead games. Um, so the origin for the minuscule post sets, yeah, so so this is why maybe maybe Wildberger is the person to actually credit with the glass bead game, but maybe he didn't call it that. Anyway, um, so Wildberger had a paper around 2003 on minuscule post sets from neighborly graph sequences. Um, and then around 2008, there was Klesham and Ram's paper, which kind of generalized Wildberger's result, which this was combinatorial in scope, um, and also applied it to construct irreducible representations, homogeneous representations of KL algebras by associating to configurations of beads basis elements. Um, and as a byproduct of so generalizing, they actually generalize certain combinatorics to the notion of a skew shaped types outside A and D, I guess. Um, yeah, this maybe is the best place to, to mention uh, the Andre's suggested or uh, Andre's comment. Um, there is a notion for minuscule Schubert varieties, and they're exactly those associated to minuscule words as we've defined them. Um, in the representation theory that I am 
interested in. Uh, we like to construct canonical bases. And some of these constructions are categorical in nature. So for example, this uh, KR, uh, sorry, KL algebras give us canonical bases. There's, oops. Um, or KLR. Um, and then these varieties of modules that we're going to be considering, those give us bases too, known as dual semi-canonical bases. And well, Schubert varieties, you know, sections of line bundles, that's going to be finite dimensional pure-ups of um, semi-simple groups. So we like to construct these guys. And we also, th th these are bases that have nice properties with respect to restriction and tensor product, just like the crystals that we're going to define soon. And we like to compare them. Um, so there's a question of, okay, and there's more. And maybe to this list, I should also add, uh, I don't really have space, cluster bases. So there's some conjectures relating kind of um, cluster bases, whatever these are, to irreducible homogeneous representations and um, kind of corresponding dual semi-canonical bases. In general, these are not equal, but maybe in certain nice cases, like in the minuscule homogeneous cases, they are coincident and we don't know that yet. And yeah, that's one kind of underlying probably motivation for Joel with uh, suggesting and starting this project. Um, but it's not something that I'll go into much anymore unless we want to talk about it after. Okay, so let's look at an example of a glass bead game. This is the fun part. In type A3, I'm going to fix W to be um, the element with this expression. S1, S2, S3, S2. And how do I play this game? Well, as I, as we saw, we're going to drop beads on the runners. One, two, three, let me number them like that. In the order that those simple reflections occur in the word for W. So first on runner um, one, so red from left to right, um, two, three, Two. Let's see. Yeah, let me go back. So note that um, this expression is not maybe note is maybe it's not so obvious as, as a note, but this um, W is not minuscule. And the way that we kind of see that in the bead game is there's this bead kind of wants to fall off. So it's not resting on anything here where it could. So with all of our minuscule reduced expressions, wherever a bead can kind of rest on another bead, it will. So there's a nice combinatorial check. Um, and now coming back to our pictures of projective modules for uh, pre-projective algebras. We can visualize these as heaps and it's very, uh, like there's not any information lost really for the projective covers of the simple modules. So if W is the unique element such that W applied to the fundamental um, omega i, is the same as applying the longest word of our while group, um, then our two characterizations, so minuscule vertex and, you know, defined in terms of the corresponding fundamental rep being minuscule, um, implies that this minimal reduced expression is minuscule too, or sorry, minim minimal w that 
kind of acts like this on omega i is minuscule too. And the projective that we're going to associate to that vertex i will have basis indexed by the heap of w with its reduced expression, um, with n reduced expression, such that I have an action of the projective algebra, sort of an arrow connecting the basis vector labeled by IA and IB, whenever IA covers IB in the heap. So this is NPI and HW. Okay, so uh, to convince you with an example, proof by example, Again, let's choose SL5 and vertex three. Here, uh, so the fundamental is just three ones followed by zeros. And then the W, which will kind of, what does W not do in type A? It just flips the weights. Um, so the W, the minimal W that accomplishes that same thing as this one. So this we've already seen. Now let's check that we kind of get the same thing if we build a heap out of the con corresponding word. And we do. Um, and you can check that kind of the information of the projective on the heap is equivalent in the way that I um, claimed on the previous slide. Okay, now 180 without any smooth transition. So we've built up, we've built up the kind of, well, more or less the two sides of the um, claim of the project, which is again, relating some combinatorial objects that are these heaps to, um, algebraic things, which are modules for the pre-projective algebra. We haven't actually seen reverse plane partitions yet. So this, and, and we've only dealt with projective modules so far, but okay, it's already enough to tell you about some crystal isomorphisms. Um, before though, what is a crystal? Um, maybe a reminder for most people is the data of a G crystal is a set that's endowed with some maps. So a weight map and a collection of FIs and phi Is and maybe also EIs and epsilon Is, but I won't include those. These are called lowering operators. And these phi Is tell us kind of how far uh, how far an element of our crystal is from being annihilated, <laughs> from being uh, killed by Fi tilt. So they satisfy that uh, if I If I apply an Fi tilt to my beta, then I'm closer to being killed than I was before. So this is the relation. Um, so to emphasize, this is a purely like set theoretic construction. And features that it enjoys, well, it's well behaved with respect to tensor product and restriction or branching, but combinatorially, set theoretically. Um, but it underlies some representation theory, um, oftentimes. So to further motivate it, in case you haven't seen it before, the idea, again, with GSLN, let's take a standard representation um, that's the n-dimensional representation for some basis. So the action of the diagonal 
matrices um, with respect to that basis in uh, SLN, well, SLV, I should say, if I'm doing it like this, or endomorphisms of this space. Um, the action of the diagonal matrices will just be by uh, whatever the corresponding diagonal entry is. So each of these basis vectors is an eigenvector. Um, and then kind of the off diagonal matrices will basically permute those, those uh, basis vectors. So EIJ denoting off diagonal. Uh, matrix with a one in position, ij and zeros everywhere else. Well, it, it'll permute, those guys will permute the basis elements exactly in the following way. If I apply to eij to bj, I'll get bi. And if, um, if j is not equal to k, it'll just kill that basis vector. So in particular, in order to kind of go from V1 to all of the other vectors, it's enough to just look at the upper triangular guides. Um, so the idea of crystals in the form of this kind of naive example is we want to encode the bare minimum combinatorial data that we're witnessing that we can, which is kind of the eigenvectors and the orbits according to some basic operators of our eigenvectors. And also weights, which I haven't written here. But the problem, or why is this picture naive, is because in general, even if we go to the adjoint representation, our um, eigenspaces are not one dimensional like they are here. So there's some non trivial geometry going on, like how you need to make choices in order to extract some raw combinatorics out of it. And it turns out that what fixes this is considering quantum groups. So a theory that's due to Kashiwara, look at representations of UQG as you take Q to zero, you kind of recover the combinatorial picture. Um, and that's what gives us the general abstract notion. And this is a nice slogan totally pulled from stage. Uh, from, from, from the Sage math website, probably written by Anna Schilling or Daniel Blum, which is that uh, quantum groups, I don't know, like I, I found it illuminating the first time I read it. So quantum groups inter interpolate between representation and the combinatorics in this way. So taking Q to zero gives us, again, combinatorics, the crystal, which is of interest for us. And Q to one gives us the replicate, although, you know. We're not going to talk about this side in this talk. Um, so what's an example of the nice property, the tensor product, which I stated to you? This means that I can take sort of two crystals, B1 and B2. This is still, I'm in the naive SL2 case, and tensor them up. So erupts of SL2, they're just indexed, uh, indexed by integers. I can tensor them up and then I have a rule telling me how that tensor product is going to decompose into irreducibles. And in this case, where I tensor up V2 and V2, what I see is it's going to decompose into three pieces. And um, So not ah, sorry, let me erase that. Branching will have to deal with restriction. Let's keep it. Tensor uh, product, I'm not going to show you any examples of branching, I don't think. 
Okay, so this is nice, but it's a little bit uh, opaque because I didn't tell you how I came up with this rule. I think it's more like V0, V2, and V4, right? Pardon? I think the, the ingredients are more like V0, V2, and V4. Uh, yeah, it depends on how you, uh, is it? Well, if you're you know. V2, your three-dimensional representation, right? Exactly. Well, anyway, oh, shoot, shoot. you're right. Yeah. Sorry, 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 sorry. I, that was my just sorry. Yeah, 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 yeah. Thank you. Okay. V0. Yep. V3 or V2 and V4. Yep. Thank you. Yeah. Okay. So it's a nice roll. Well, but arguably it's a little bit opaque. Um, combinatorially, another thing that this is telling us is sort of the number of skew skew tableau of shape new lambda and weight mu where the weight uh, nu is allowed to vary just for many of the choices of mu's will be zero and the lambda I guess in this case lambda and mu are both just two but they're going to be the weights of the component of the factors more generous so it's arguably op opaque or maybe not so well motivated. Well, presumably it comes from quantum groups, but um, the, the crystal isomorphism that we established gives a geometric way of thinking about it. But there's another motivation. And as I said already with the heaps that we've seen, we can talk about crystals. Crystals for minuscule heaps are formed as follows. So we can consider in our poset um, H of W, the set of order ideals, which I'll just define as elements V of W that are uh, less than or equal to W in the Bruja order. So occur as um, prefixes or, or admit expressions such that those expressions occur as prefixes of our, of some reduced word for W. I think left weak order, you can check if you're interested. Um, this set is going to be a crystal. And with respect to a very easy rule, if we think of elements, um, if we think of H of W as bead configurations. So remember this is so the rule, and I'll just say what it is for the lowering operators is I'm going to remove a bead from runner I if the result is again um, a bead game for a minuscule um, element of W. And otherwise, I will kill this element. And whose crystal is this? It's precisely the crystal of the Demajure module, which is just, um, you can take this as a definition again, um, for here, lambda, a witness of W, which I won't recall, but we had some definition on a previous slide. This is the, uh, just the direct sum of those weight spaces that are got by looking at elements in the set of order ideals. 
to figure this out, we can compare kind of characters. So it, it falls out pretty quickly. But again, this is the very base case. So in an example, we're going to look at our word S2132 again. The heap, well, I drop 2132 is this. I guess here I've added uh, what the formulation is in the other less visual definitions. This is Stanbridge, and this is keeping track of um, the subwords, which is useful for understanding the order ideals. So the order ideals of this guy in that definition on, on just as, as subwords with respect to like the prefix for hot order is going to be this set of elements and I can arrange them in the form of a crystal in this way, where it's not a coincidence that, you know, it looks like the crystal of the representation of, um, well, in this case, I think it's O lambda is equal to omega 2, but I have not checked that, so check this crystal of the omega 2 or so, uh, sorry. Um, yeah, but the action is easy as I, as we wrote it out, we're going to remove a bead from runner two if we can, um, if, when we apply F2 from runner one, when we apply F1 and so on, and that's our heap as a crystal. Um, we want to spice it up a little, so these, these, these are very sort of simple crystals. In order to do that, we're going to kind of stack these guys. So reverse plane partitions are the generalizations of our heaps. And they're going to be defined as follows. So RWM will denote the set of order reversing maps from the heap of W to the set 0, 1, up to M. This is like a a souped up, probably you spell that um, heap. So order reversing where we have a, a order on the on the heap coming from the plus structure there, um, a, a, well, a partial order there, and a total order here is just one. Is is just the usual, you know, increasing order. Um, so order reversing means that when we, well, okay, we're going to view these maps as what you really know reverse plane partitions to be, if you've seen them, um, or they're pretty intuitive if you haven't. Namely, they're like these three-dimensional arrays of blocks stacked on one another, um, but we're laying the, we're sort of, we're stacking where our underlying, so we're stacking on top of the heap of W. We have these kind of rectangular pictures for our heaps, and we're gonna stack on top of the elements, however many blocks um, phi of that element is. And order reversing will mean that towards the bottom of the heap will have kind of the tallest stack of blocks. Um, in the case that M is one, we just get back the order ideals. So again, visualizing this M equals one case for the word two, one, three, two, four, three, a little bit more complicated now. Um, we have the all zero RPP, then kind of one rank one RPP, two rank two RPPs, uh, 
to rank three, two rank four, one rank five, and one rank six. And this set is all together is JHW or R W one. So it's going to get quite a bit more complicated quite quickly. And what we establish is that if P is a minuscule vertex, then this set of RPPs is a model for um, the crystal of weight M omega P, where again, P and W are related by. No, and um, I'm, a, I'm, um, I'm, yep. I'm a, confused by uh, one small point. I thought the function phi, it kind of measures how many more lives you you have in this game or something like that, right? As you're about to be killed by Fs, this this is supposed to be zero. Oh, uh, yeah, that's a poor notation. They're different. Oh, uh, this like, is not the phi, there's something else. It's like, you know, minus yeah, no, no. or the, the complementary to phi or something like that. Oh, it's, it's not even complementary now. Phi, I'm just using, yeah, we, we... Oh, phi is not that function, right? Yeah. Phi is something else. Okay, okay, cool. Sorry, yeah. The, this phi is denoting element of this guy. This phi, yeah, this is like crystal datum. But that's a good point. I shouldn't use the same letter. Um, the whole rest of the slides, though, will be working with this phi, so elements of the RPP. Um, right, so our main result is that this set is a model for this crystal. And if you like, you can go through and un unpack, well, in some examples, you know, what the relation between all of those parameters is. Because it might not be so helpful for me to just say it and remind you. I mean, just the parameter W here on Omega P. But okay, the idea and then is the, the following. In, in, so we're going to type. Sorry, sorry, and then in type A, those are really plain precisions, right? That fit in some kind of box or something like that. Is yeah, okay. exactly. Okay. In type A, yeah, I didn't draw any pictures for D four, but they, uh, yeah, they don't look like. Well, I mean, so in D4, we might have a heap that looks like this. And then I guess it generalizes a plain partition, but you're like stacking the boxes on these things. <laughs> so like maybe here I'll have three boxes and here I'll have two. Yeah. And then we will also have one and one. Yeah, in type A, they're honest plane partitions. In types D and E, they look funkier. And cool, thanks. Um, the idea is to decompose our given partition as a sum of zero, one RPPs. So it's very simple, such that, so we're going to write this phi as a as a sum, which we can do. Just look at the layers in this guy. Um, and it's going to be ordered. And we're going to define a map into this formal kind of tensor product where we know we already have, by this character argument, a crystal here that is the crystal of the corresponding Demisier module. We're going to define a map that takes me to a tensor product of its uh, composite zero one factors. And then the rule will be to just pull back um, the tensor product uh, rule to RWM sort of on the image of 
RWM in that tensor product. So in an example, what do I mean by the decomposition? I'm going to peel off sort of the maximal RPP that I can. That's a 0, 1 RPP. So that's a diamond of ones. And then whatever I have left over, I can again decompose, peel off the max layer of a 0, 1 RPP that I can. It's going to be 0, 1, 1. And I'm left with just a 1. Um, so this element, and this is an element in, that's our usual S2, S1, S3, S2 of level three. The M here will be, I'll, I can just put the max entry that I see occurring. Um, so this is going to map to 1, 1, 1 tensor. 0, 0, 1, 1, 0, 0, 1. In here. Where again, I have some rule for applying F for applying a lowering operator to this product. This is a fun exercise. You can try to figure out what, like, what is F2? Let's see. Um, but it's not always what it seems. So, so first of all, yeah, F2 here is the interesting one because I kind of have two levels from which I can remove a B, but I shouldn't really view my uh, non-01 RPPs as glass bead games. They're again, they're kind of stacked glass bead games. So which layer am I removing that bead from is, um, is the challenge, is what my non-trivial tensor product rule is telling me. But now we're going to see that there's a geometric reason for which layer I choose to. And the proof, OK, so the geometric reason comes from quiver varieties. The proof that this pullback tensor product kind of works out, um, it, well, is relies on this claim that these RPPs label irreducible components of modules for the pre-projective algebra. And that's what requires quiver varieties, too. Um, so combinatorics from the geometry of quiver varieties, really quiver Grassmannians, which are kind of core quiver varieties are the same as core quiver varieties due to work of Savage and Tingley um, of minuscule projectives. And what are these quiver Grassmannians? They're kind of simpler to define than the core quiver varieties, which is why we're going to just uh, define them. Um, what are they in the case that we're interested in? So they're Grassmannians, but of I graded vector spaces. So I fix a dimension vector and I look at all submodules of P I, my projective M times, um, that are of this dimension. So by Savage and Tingley, this is the same as, okay, I've added uh, equals, but I won't define this. <laughs> uh, yeah, you can look up the definition. So this is the core quiver variety for the dimension vector w is just m omega i. So like it's a, a framed, it's a framed quiver for my underlying Dinkin diagram with only one framing vertex that's not zero. Um, right, so this combinatorics comes from this, the geometry of these quiver Grassmannians via the isomorphism or the bijection of irreducible components over the union of all dimension vectors and this set of RPPs. So how to define this bijection? Uh, OK, this is geometry overload slide. Uh, we're going to, but again, in the, in, in the 
well, I didn't need to switch slides here. In, in the case that we are considering, it's pretty nothing fancy going on. So we're going to fix a filtration of our ambient kind of module. And then for any submodule, M will define, will adapt that filtration to M by saying let M less than or equal to K be M intersect those um, first K guys. Um, then for some C star action, we have the following kind of heavy duty result that we're just using, which is that the fixed points of this um, quiver Grassmannian under the C star is a disjoint union over all partitions of our dimension vector of these individual PIs. So it's always going to be an M fold in this case. Um, product of quiver grass names. And then taking the limit, so because our varieties are projective and really this requires sort of factoring through the tensor product quiver variety. But because our varieties are projective, taking the limit kind of um, allows us to homotopy retract our irreducible components. So index them by a simpler set, which is this set in the in the in the fixed point in the description of the fixed point set. Um, by just pulling back elements of this disjoint union. And those are easy to describe. So because remember what our PIs look like are well in type A. Our PIs are these kind of diamond modules. So for a given dimension vector, there's not a lot of choice of submodules. In fact, there's only one non-trivial way for a given dimension vector for a sub to sit in here, if it even makes sense. Because I have like just one dimensional spaces on, on each of those dots, those rep re represent single vertices. So these are all points geometrically. Um, so yeah, my irreducible components here are going to be just modules such that their um, composition factors with respect to this filtration are isomorphic to the, the, the points that I'm pulling back. So here, n, v1, and up to n, v, n, is maybe the one sub that I can form if I can form it in there. And is that, is that are you describing uh, like attracting manifolds of, uh, of some yeah. point with respect to that action? Is that? Yep. OK, cool. Exactly. Um, and I'm going to be able to label. So see, this pink set is really just, I have my limit map. I don't know where the orange color is, but I'm going to take the pre-image of those points. And like, this is it. it. It has this description. So there's something to show to make sure that it has this description. But um, it's not so difficult to see that we can label it by an RPP because all of those subs, like as I reminded you in this really chicken scratch picture, um, all of those subs are somehow zero one sub modules. They're already zero one RPPs. So the thing that we choose to label this particular component is the thing that we get by stacking those sub modules viewed as zero one RPPs. Um, okay, this is an irreducible component.
so we're really relying on Nakajima's work and uh, to, to, to get this. They're sort of clever varieties are sneaking up where for, for, for lack of a more direct uh, proof. We do have a conjecture for another description of these irreducible components that's as follows. We can describe we can define a uh, nilpotent transformation on our um, on our projectors that's induced from the transformation that's got by like sending a bead that's next to another bead in the chain over a given vertex down, remembering that the beads represent basis vectors. And look at the transformation that that induces on submodules, and then conjecturally describe this XV as the set of submodules such that uh, remember that they're I graded, so the piece living over the C kind of column or runner or um, vertex intersect the h power of our kernel is going to have dimension sum up the values of the RPPs in that column. Um, so this would be a more direct way to do this, but it's not completely fleshed out yet, which is why I leave it as a conjecture. Um, for example, let's see what that means in an example when uh, my RPP is this RPP for A3, then I'm looking at, so I want a way to associate a module inside the projective over vertex two, direct sum two. And the way I'm going to do it is, as we saw, I'll see that the, um, so sorry, what's the T going to do? It's going to send this bead to zero, this bead to zero, this bead to this bead, and this bead to zero. This is our no potent transformation. So I'm going to take a submodule such that intersecting with the kernel of T, I have dimension one, two, and one over each of those uh, I graded pieces of M. And with the kernel of T squared, well, that's my entire module. Um, so in this case, M is just going to look like its picture in a way. Um, I can draw M as sort of take a line here and a line here um, and send them to some, not the same line necessarily. So make it as generic as possible to uh, something in this kind of middle C2. Um, okay, so this is a way that this tells me also how to interpret RPPs as modules, which are generic for the components labeled by those RPPs. OK, in another example, my 111 RPP will be um, will just end up being this module. So my nilpotent will again send this guy here to zero and send this basis vector to this basis vector. So I'm asking that kind of the first power of T, the kernel of that intersects in dimension one, my module over vertex two, in dimension one, my module over vertex one and three. And then it again intersects um, the second power 
in two dimensions. So this point and this point dies. Um, yeah, and those are my two modules. So as an aside, like this might be kind of a fun problem to think about. Um, the last examples exhibit a feature of this set that we are describing. These, uh, the, the, this core quarter variety for M omega P of weight nu. So note that these are both dimension alpha one plus two alpha two plus alpha three this one in the previous example. And they're small enough that we can work out exactly kind of the geometry of the variety of such modules. So we conjecture that these varieties are equidimensional, but we don't have, a, we don't know a proof or a reference for a proof on the core quiver variety side of that. I don't know, maybe you know, um, it would be helpful to me, let me know. Um, but yeah, in the, in those examples that we just carried out, the geometry is kind of interesting. So the 111 RPP will define the variety of modules that looks like a T star P1 or maybe it's actually, yeah. Um, that's like a, here's a brick surface and the variety of 0121 RPPs will, or sorry, the one to one RPPs will define a variety of modules that looks like P1 cross P1. Because I have sort of um, a P1 worth of choices for where I send this one generically and where I send this one. But this becomes really, really hard to figure out when you look at a bigger RPP. What are the equations on the modules? What are the generic kind of solutions? Um, so at least in this case, we see that this is going to be equidimensional. This is the new weight space for alpha 1 plus 2 alpha 2 plus alpha 3. And while this slide is maybe for you, this part of the slide is maybe for you to think about in your own time, but how would you actually work out that geometry? You'd look at the matrices defining the action and the pre-projective relation that they have to satisfy. Okay. So finally, to get to the interpretation, the geometry of the signature rule coming from this isomorphism. On components of this quark river variety, the rule is given by this nice short exact sequence. So nice enough that it should be framed. And I think that this is due to Sato. On components of the core quiver variety, with respect to a general point of that component, um, which we show can be labeled by RPPs, the lowering operator will give me this kind of this, the, the, the sub such that. the quotient is SI. So the signature rule on the tensor product of the given RPP, it's some combinatorial rule that keeps track of how many beads can be added or removed from every runner and tells us which runner to modify according to some cancellation rule. Um, it ends up being, at least in type A, that we're going to apply Fi to the rightmost uncanceled minus sign. So the rightmost configuration of these where I can remove a runner, I'll remove a runner where the pluses and minuses will denote can add a bead, can remove a bead, can remove a bead this decomposition, so in an example. Um, here, I cannot remove a bead. This is describing the action of F2 example. Sorry, squishing that in there. Um, so I just, I record the ones where I can add or remove and I cancel plus minus pairs. So what I'm left with is just unambiguously change 
this guy. And in a bigger example, I'll first, so this is an RPP type A5. So I'll first decompose this. It's bigger, but it's not so difficult because the composition, the zero one composition factors, there's not that many. It's basically almost zero one. Um, I'll decompose this and I'll look at my factors. So here I can add a bead and here I can remove a bead. And I won't consider this, I don't know why I wrote this here. I only care about kind of the factors. Um, so because adding and, my, adding and removing cancels combinatorially, actually applying F3 here, there's nothing, there's no tensor factor to apply it to. So this RPP will just get killed. But from the point of view of the module, this is telling me that I can make a non-trivial extension out of this guy and this guy, viewed honestly as modules for the pre-projected algebra. But I can visualize like this, that doesn't have S2 as a quotient, or sorry, S3. So where are these and one, and two, that does not have S2 as a simple quotient. And that's why I'm going to kill this configuration, because the corresponding module doesn't have S2 as a quotient. Um, so more generally, you can imagine, like I give you a RPP, you can think of it as a module by filtering by zero one submodules in the way that you would filter the corresponding RPP. And then, well, thinking about the composition factors, so looking at the harder Narasimha filtration, as it's sometimes called, but with respect to these particular pieces, and keeping track of where can we apply fi or for that matter where can we apply ei tilt which i haven't told you but just uh combinatorially it's where can i add a bead and then recording you know minus for remove plus for add applying some cancellation and then applying your final fi to the rightmost um minus sign whatever it is precisely, it corresponds to the fact that whenever I have a plus followed by a minus, I, I can form this non-trivial extension which will not have SI as a sub quotient. So that's the geometric interpretation for the rule. And uh, somehow if it's like not a very balanced filtration, I'll have SI left over to remove. Um, and I think that's it. So this is just another slide to restate what the rule will be if we can apply it. Um, yeah, thank you for, for listening. I've gone almost an hour. Um, questions? I do these combinatorics, but instead of partitions whose projection is some rectangle, I, I allow the projection to be some other shape. Does that have any chance of having some meaning? Um, so you mean, Which pictures are you referring to as rectangles? Um, the all of these ones. Like the kind of chocolate bar. Yeah, yeah. So the partitions. Uh, yeah, yeah. The RPPs, right? Yeah, in type A, they're all going to be rectangular. 
well, yeah, I don't know if it's an RPP for a minuscule heap, there's a meaning. So there are other shapes, as I said, they're type B and E, you know, for the, for the spin minuscules, we'll have one shape and we'll have another shape for the other minuscule guys. Yeah, they won't look like chocolate bars <laughs> and there'll be an interpretation. <laughs> but I don't know. It's got to come somehow from a Jenkins diagram, so we can't just take like an arbitrary thing, I think. I had a question. I'm, um, is that, is that clear? Where do you use uh, the fact that it's uh, actually minuscule? Your way. That's a good question. Um, I'm trying to think for type D. I don't, I just, I don't think that there's a notion of a heap for a non minuscule, but I don't oh, I see. know why. Yeah, there's not. Oh, there's I see. Not. I see. Oh, yeah. Just because you have to have, you have to, you need all weights to be, you need somehow parameterize the weights by the permutations. And then, uh, but imagine yeah. you had, uh, but suppose out of some kind of, suppose I gave you some kind of crystal and it mm -hmm. looks like a rectangle or something else, right? And then I'd like uh, to have like a reverse placementation of, uh, over that, over that, uh, over that particular process. Is that you think, you think that would be, that has a chance to be, I mean, kind of close to the nose question, I think. I give you some kind of poset and I postulate that this is a poset of some, it's like the replacement of the heap. And mm -hmm. then uh, and then if I take RPPs with that poset, that does would that have a meaning uh, in terms of... Uh, if you take RPPs with that poset, yeah, I think it's similar to Noah's question, right? Uh, like the, well, like the post, post, you know, a, a statement of the kind, like you have some kind of module for which you understand the crystal in some way. Uh -huh. Then you take uh, take it like m times the m times the highest weight or whatever m times the label, and you'd like to say, well, this is like a it's like a RPPs on that poset, but with with this value m. Is that is that has any chance of something like that being true? One. Yeah, exactly. When it's not, I mean, it's just. It just tells you that uh, going from kind of m equals one to m equals whatever in general, there's some procedure yeah. which re re which resembles what you've been doing. Yeah. Yeah, I think so. If there's a. I think I have a chance of being true. I I, I okay, think so. Cool. Yeah. If there's a crystal well, it has a chance. Cool. Yeah, it's not something that we've thought of yet. There's um, a lot of uh, directions to generalize. Because that that that's that argument when you had uh, that argument when you had like with the torus action attracting manifolds and so forth. Yep. They're that um, they're not clear where that minuscule enter if whether minuscule enters there, so that's not so clear to me. Where is that? Uh -huh. yeah, and, yeah, maybe. Is it can we define a Like how how will we define this p sub i <laughs> for non minuscule vertices? <laughs> I guess. But p was just some projective module over your algebra, right? So I mean, it exists exists for everything. Yeah, but it's like specifically the one over i such that the omega i is minuscule is like so the corresponding to the representation of the omega i. Okay. All right. Maybe we will not uh, solve, or maybe you will not solve this question before uh, before the new year. But uh, still, it's I a think good it's question. An interesting thing to think about. Yeah, because we can rewrite more, things more questions. Dominant, so basically. Yeah, I think that this diagram looks general to me. I'm not. I'm not sure what in the diagram you use. 
you start you start with the sum module and and then you associate some stuff to that module and then you take that m times the m times the corresponding thing and then it's a, you can you, I mean there's it sounds to me like there's going to be some some you know some similar geometric argument having to do with filtrations and um, yeah, I, I just don't know what projector would replace the role of the PI, but I think that there is something to think about. Yeah. Cool. Yeah, no, sorry, sorry. Like this, this totally goes through. You don't need PI here. You're, you're right. Uh, yeah, so, so it would be good to like start on the quiver side and then see what you get. Yeah. Christmas homework. <laughs> More questions? Well, all right. It's been a, a fun uh, year for the seminar. I'm sure everybody enjoyed every single aspect of uh, of how the seminar ran this year. <laughs> well, so uh, happy new year, everybody! Happy holidays. Uh, we'll uh, we'll res we'll resume uh, we'll resume at some point in 2021. And thanks, Anne. That was a lot of fun. And uh, so great. Thank you so thank much you. for uh, being able to give us a talk and during, so to speak, you know, exact. Yeah, I think it's exam period so officially, right? <laughs> it's not. It's not. A, it's not. A... Okay. Hey, thanks, everybody. Have a good break, guys. Thanks for coming. Bye, Noah. Bye, Anne. Bye, David. Bye. Bye. Didn't get a chance to say hi to Jordan.